Uh, to me, one of the most wildest things was that Hoover even attacked gay people. When he himself was gay, and nobody ever had the courage to say this, he lived with Clyde Tolson as man and wife for 30 of the years that he ran the FBI. And if somebody applied to the FBI and was gay, he would be rejected because he was queer. I mean, you know, it's, it's a kind of theory of royalty that the king can do no wrong. It's the big corporations that buy most of the uh, modern art for their corporate buildings or... Or donate, them, or donate them to the Museum of Modern Art right. and the major museums around the country and get healthy tax deductions and all. It, Painting has to do with money. There's no doubt about that. Mm. There's no question that, uh, that my work and the work of the men I respect took a revolutionary position, you might say, against the bourgeois notion of what a painting is as an object, aside from what it is as a uh, statement. This is the strength of democracies, that they create the illusion of change. But in fact, what they do is permit change a certain kind of change. And when the students in the 60s got hard, they were crushed. Chicago, the 1968 Chicago riots were by the police, not by the students. And that police riot was planned. The point of that police riot was to go out over world television to say that the United States government would take no more of this. That if you were willing to have your skull cracked, if you were willing to spend a few days in jail crowded like sheep, if you were willing to have your record destroyed forever and go into a permanent FBI file, then you could demonstrate in that way. And if not, not. The last in our four-part series featuring the documentaries of America's greatest documentary filmmaker, Emile D'Antonio, right now on Alternative Views. Emile D'Antonio, one of the greatest documentary filmmakers of all time, has taken on the tough and controversial issues of his day. His first film, Point of Order, took on Joe McCarthy, the demagogic senator who carried out the anti-communist witch hunts. His second film is on the Kennedy assassination. That film, Rushed to Judgment, attacks the Warren Commission and the theory that a lone assassin, Lee Harvey Oswald, killed JFK. D'Antonio then made a controversial film on the Vietnam War, In the Year of the Pig, which attacked U.S. aggression in Vietnam. His next film, Milhouse, presented a critical portrait of Richard Milhouse Nixon and got D'Antonio on Nixon's enemy list. Later in the 1970s, D'Antonio made a film about the weather underground, the 1960s radicals who were high on the FBI's most wanted list. D found them and made a film. The FBI couldn't. In addition, he finished his film on the New York art scene, Painter's Painting, and made a film in the King of Prussia on the Catholic pacifists who attacked a nuclear weapons inst installation in Pennsylvania. Most recently, D'Antonio has finished a semi-autobiographical documentary, Mr. Hoover and I, about his films, his politics, and his longtime relationship with the FBI, which compiled over 10,000 pages of documents on him and his filmmaking and other activities. Then I went on to finish Painter's Painting, which I had begun. 
And Painter's Painting is a film about people who were friends of mine, and political people never liked the film because it was a celebration of New York painting. It starred Bill de Kooning and Andy Warhol and Jasper Johns and Frank Stella and Robert Rauschenberg and a, and a great many painters and people in the art world of New York. And this had never been done before. You know, just think of what it would have been like in, to, to have lived in Paris and have a camera crew and film Brock and Matisse and Picasso. And that's exactly the way New York was, uh, say, from 1949, 1950, to the time I filmed them in 1970, and on past 1970. But I mean, I chose, I was there. I and I knew those people well. Uh, I knew Rauschenberg and Johns before they ever sold a painting. A woman I used to live with gave uh, Warhol his first job. Uh, I knew these people extremely well. I met Frank Stella when he was still a student at Princeton. And uh, I knew de Kooning from long before and Barnett Newman. And uh, most of my political friends hate that art and they hate the fact that these people have all made millions and millions of dollars. <laughs> I mean, millions. Those people make more than bank presidents do and they're not even crooks. <laughs> uh, so that... Um, I think that nobody makes as much money in America today, including movie stars and Jasper Johns. He probably makes, uh, I know that he sells about 10 paintings a year for 800,000 each. Mm. And then he sells some of his older paintings for a lot of money. The idea that had come to me that, um, that I should have to mean what I did, then, Accompanying that was that there was no reason to mean what other people did. And so if I could tell that I was doing what someone else was doing, then I would try not to do it. Because it seemed to me that de Kooning did his work perfectly beautifully, and there was no reason for me to help him with it. I did not want a small gesture standing at the easel with a sable brush. And having looked at Cubism, which can be very detailed and minute and fine and has that essence at times of the easel and the sable brush, I literally wanted to break free, put it on the floor, throw the paint around. A picture that is beautiful or comes off or works looks as if it all was made in one stroke at once. Is it hard to be a woman to be a painter? Well, I think the first issue is uh, being a painter. The abstract expressionists and myself had what they had in common, we had in common was uh, touch. Uh, I was never interested in their pessimism or editorializing. You have to have time to feel sorry for yourself if you're going to be a good abstract expressionist. And uh, I think I always considered that a waste. Andy, uh, when I first knew you, uh, you weren't painting and then you did become a painter, and I wonder if you could tell me why that happened and when it happened and something about it. Well, uh, well you made me the painter. No, cut. Uh, let's, let's, no, let's yeah. have the true things. No, that was the truth, wasn't it? I used to gossip about the art, art people. And uh, uh, that's how I found out about art. <laughs> no, no, then you thought it was chic. Right. So you started art. No, no, Dee was making art commercial. And since I was in commercial art, I thought, well, real art should be commercial because Dee said so. And that's how it all happened. Is well, that true? No. Yes, it is. Not entirely. The one thing that got through to me was the notion of if there's anything that you want to do that's meaningful, in my case, it was painting. Do it. 
How do you relate Painter's painting to your other work? How do you see it in relation to your political films? Well, what I always said I was doing with my films, once I got a few of them made, was to try to put on film the history of my time that interested me. And the painting of my time interests me. And it's not political. The very, the very world around painting is essentially a reactionary world. It's a world of many millionaires getting their kicks by buying paintings. It's a, it's a series of sharp dealers, of hokey museums, but it's also done by people who came from all sorts of classes. Most of the painters I knew came from the poor, and they're now super millionaires. Uh, it's, and I don't care about the money, my, you know. I mean, even though I own some of their works, I don't care about the money. Uh, I like the work. It's, uh, and as I told you before, I'm a patriot. I, I you know, um, American art was really strong and, uh, and new and vital and interesting. And painting has always been for the rich. In the Middle Ages, it was the church that was rich. You don't think that peasants commissioned art in the 12th century. It was cardinals and popes, kings and lords. Painting, anything that's tactile. You see, the beauty about film is that it's very nature should be democratic, that anybody can go into a theater and look at it. Uh, the beauty of the written word is almost the same thing. Even though books cost $20 today, it's not really that serious. But if you want to buy a major Jasper Johns work that's old, you're going to have to lay out $10 million. And that immediately takes most people out of the market. <laughs> yes. <laughs> but it doesn't mean that it's necessarily bad. Maybe the people who buy those paintings are bad. <laughs> But the people who make them are not. It is uh, priced at forty thousand, but uh, actually I'd be satisfied if I get thirty-five. I have a fifteen thousand uh, dollar profit on that, you know. After all, no, I'm not very busy. I'm, I'm I have D'Antonio here, and then making a film. And he, he's making a film, you know, like the McCarthy film, but without McCarthy. <laughs> about the art world. The uh, collectors have made an enormous contribution, not only to the market, uh, but to painters themselves. It seems to me that the fact of the skulls, the fact of Dr. Ludwig, these people that buy, that set standards, uh, make everyone else itch to emulate. The itch to emulate, the desire for status, is certainly one of the main things in our society. Frankly, uh, I think that, uh, frankly, this uh, accusation uh, that's leveled against the dealers uh, that they, they uh, are responsible for shaping the art market is a, is a very silly one. Naturally, we are, we are there to do that job and we are doing it. Now, if people, uh, ourselves, and the critics, and the museums uh, uh, go along with us, then there is a consensus there, and therefore we are right and not wrong. So I think that uh, what, what we are doing is merely doing our job. I had learned from many people who seem to be taken with the fact that uh, my uh, purchasing art has changed the lives of uh, quite a few of these artists. And uh, of course I'm aware of just a, a few of them. Uh, one of jo is John Chamberlain who was a hairdresser when I met him. Big fellow, long mustache, and I couldn't imagine him being a hairdresser. And working on sculpture was such a, a horrible situation for him to suddenly make a shift from being a hairdresser to working in this powerful iron and tin. And so he said to me, if he only had 10 or 15 weeks of a steady income of, I think it was $100 a week, why, he said, I would be able to tell my boss to go to the devil and really do this work. And I was so um, impressed by his work that I said, go ahead. And of course, right after that uh, summer, he never, uh, right after that summer, he never was a, uh, hairdresser again. Sorry. Uh, he became a full-time sculptor. Uh, with Larry Poons, uh, with Larry Poons, I found out he was a, uh, uh, was a short order cook. And I said, well, how much do you make a week? He said, uh, $25. I said, what are you talking about? Nobody makes $25 a week anymore. He said, well, what I mean is I only work two hours a day and that gives me enough, uh, to, um, to, uh, I said, well, I said, I'll give you uh, eight weeks' worth of salary. Uh, I'll buy a painting from you. And he looked at me very suspiciously, you know, and he said, uh, 
Well, I'm willing to quit my job, he said, but I want the eight weeks in advance, because if you change your mind, he says, I'm out of a job. Yeah. Robert Skull never walked up to me and gave, has said, here, Larry, I want you to, I want to help you. He did it through Dick, and it was a dealer, and it was business, you know? I mean, if he wants to think of himself in that way, I've got, I've got right. nothing against it, you know? It had been my intention to be an artist since I was a child. And in the place where I was a child, there were no artists, so I didn't, and there was no art, so I really didn't know what that meant. And I think it meant that I would be able to be in a situation other than the one that I was in. I think that was primary, the primary fantasy. Whereas the, the society there seemed to accommodate every other thing I knew about, but not, but not, not that possibility. So I think that in part the idea of being an artist was, was uh, that kind of fantasy of, of being out of this. Then, because there's none of this here, so if you're going to be it, you'll have to be somewhere else. <laughs> so I like that, and plus I like to do things with my hands and all. There has never been a, a tradition of political art in the United States that people have made a lot of money on. Like when no. you go down to Mexico, wow, you see these incredible great political murals. Great, and great you work. realize what's missing in the United States. Is art that carefully controlled to keep out the political uh, art in uh, the United States? Well, let's put it this way. We've never had an artist of quality who tried to do political art. I mean, Ben Sean was not art of quality. And uh, uh, Jack Levine is not an art of quality. The Germans have produced political art, modern German art. There's a guy called Hans Hacke, who is quite amazing. Um, he's attacked Margaret Thatcher. He's attacked uh, Reagan. Uh, and he's done it brilliantly. I've seen Swedish political art, too. That's and I've good. spent a lot of time in Sweden and seen Swedish Denmark. political art, but it's not as good as German. Mm. Uh, there is one man now who's doing serious political art who's, made, who's a success, but it's, it's a minority because, frankly, pay, what, is, what can be owned, you can't own a film, basically, except a cassette. And you, and you can't own a book in the sense that you own the rights of it. But when you own a painting, you own the entire thing. Nobody can reproduce it without your permission. It's yours, and there's a kind of ownership. It's a, it, and it transcends the concept of bourgeois society because it goes back, as I say, to lordly societies and religious societies. The greatest collections of old art in the world were, were by the popes. You can still go to Rome and see not just Michelangelo's chapel, but see one painting after another. The ruling class have always controlled art as a sign of their temporal power. Absolutely. And it continues to this day. It's the big corporations that buy most of the uh, modern art for their corporate buildings or, or donate them, Or donate them to the Museum of Modern Art right. and the major museums around the country and get healthy tax deductions and all. It, painting has to do with money. There's no doubt about that. Mm. There's no question that, uh, that my work and the work of the men I respect took a revolutionary position, you might say, against the bourgeois notion of what a painting is as an object aside from what it is, as a uh, statement. <coughs> because in the end, you couldn't even contain it in the ordinary bourgeois home. There's more to the problem, it seems to me, than any, any old-fashioned idea of what an easel painting is. A painting can be bigger than anything that can go on an easel and still be, in my opinion, an easel painting. And in the end, in the end, size doesn't count. Whether the easel painting is small or big is not the issue. Size doesn't count. It's scale that counts. It's human scale that counts. And the only way you can achieve human scale is by the content. Why, why do we seem to get involved with bigger and bigger paintings with the American art today? Oh, <clears throat> I think there are lots of reasons for that. I mean, the scale of America is different. We'd say most American painters work in what were once small factories. Uh, most European artists work in either apartments or studios that were designed 
in terms of easel painting. But there's no doubt, too, that there's a different experience in a large picture. But I think it has more to do with a heroic impulse as compared with the intimacy of French painting. I feel that I'm an American painter in the sense that uh, this is where I, I, I grew up and lived, was born, and this is where I've uh, developed my uh, ideas and so on. At the same time, I uh, hope that my work transcends the issue of uh, being an American. I recognize that I'm an American because I'm not a Czechoslovak. <laughs> and my work was not painted in Czechoslovakia or in Hungary or in India. <clears throat> but I hope that my work can be seen and understood on a universal basis. That is, that the language is uh, of, of, of a nature that it doesn't have the necessity for its American labels. Tell us about your film, Mr. Hoover and I. That uh, really takes courage in this day and age to uh, attack the FBI directly. I believe enough in this country so that I don't think it takes courage to attack the FBI. I've been attacking it all the time, but I, I wanted to attack the... I wanted to do something that had never been done before. I wanted to tell my life story and do it in terms of Mr. Hoover, the head of the FBI, and his interest in me, which began when I was 16 years old, and to make a film that would reflect the bounce and the heat that existed between the FBI and me from that time to the present. At 16 years of age? He was actually... Well, I mean, he had every right to, uh, to have a small interest in me because I, I was a precocious person. and I entered Harvard at 16, which was fairly young to begin with. And then I joined three radical groups. I joined the Young Communist League. I joined the John Reed Society. John Reed was a Harvard graduate who covered the Russian Revolution and changed. And um, I joined the American Student Union, which was like SDS was in the 60s, but that was a long time before. And I think that the FBI should have taken a file out on me and then realized that it was nonsense because I didn't do anything, basically. I mean, I wasn't old enough. I wasn't political enough. I did it to find out. I mean, I went to demonstrations, and um, but there was nothing too crazy. I mean, I, but this was the 1930s when the country was in a Great Depression. Oh yes. When there were hundreds of thousands, maybe a millions, militant union. And we were getting ready to go to war with Hitler, a war activists. in which I enlisted. But right. that's something else. I mean, there's no doubt about that. Mm -hmm. uh, but the FBI, you see, the real problem is that the FBI is always being a, a secret police force. As I said before, the FBI does have a charter, which is to go after criminals, but it doesn't have any charter to go after thought, to do thought control, or to care what organizations I belong to. If those organizations break the law, or if I break the law, then the FBI should come after me. But those, dis organ those organizations did not break the law, and neither did I. What's the significance of Hoover for you? Well, Hoover is the quintessential lying, cold warrior bureaucrat all of those things are evil he's one of the truly most evil people that our society has produced in 1939 hoover expanded the bureaucrat's dream he began the program of custodial detention now custodial detention is simply a nice way of saying concentration camp what it meant was that those who disagreed with the u.s government on any level, decided on by Hoover and the FBI, could be put into a camp. I was among a small group of people chosen for custodial detention. As soon as it came out, of course, we had a reasonable Attorney General of the United States at that time. His name was Francis Biddle, and he canceled custodial detention. So you think, democracy triumphs. America is right after all, but don't forget the bureaucrat. Mr. Hoover dutifully got rid of custodial detention, and he just started a new file called Security Matters. Security Matters was custodial detention under a new name. So if the Attorney General said, 
What have we done now about custodial detention? Mr. Hoover could say with a straight face, it's gone. But it was gone into another file. When security matters was discovered, it too was abandoned. And then came the name that Mr. Hoover must have loved most of all, the do not file files. These were special files that never went into the ordinary files that ordinary FBI agents had access to, or the con congressional committees could de demand, or that even I could demand. The do not file files, if they were of any significance, went directly to the director. I, I can't get over Hoover ever. For all the years of my life, all these long years, he was in command of, uh, for most of them, until he died in 1972. But for many of the years of my life, he ran the secret police of my country. And there are isolated fragments of Hoover that still stick to me. In the days of the Rosenberg case, he pushed and pushed. He wanted Ethel Rosenberg to be electrocuted. Now, I'm not a psychoanalyst, as my wife is. I'm not interested in, in doing psychoanalytical history. But yet it disturbed me at the time, and it still disturbs me, that the head of the secret police of this big country would be so passionate that a Rosenberg woman go to the chair. Uh, the U.S. attorney did not want that. In fact, people thought the whole case could get blown because of that, but he pushed very hard. I won't surmise why. Another example of the FBI and women was the persecution of Gene Seberg. Seberg was plucked from total obscurity to play jo Joan of Arc in a big Hollywood film from Iowa. She was a high school girl, not yet a woman, a very young person, plucked from Iowa to play that role. And she went into the whole world of Hollywood and France and here and there. And in the course of it, she acquired politics. And she supported the black movement. And she became pregnant. And the FBI said that her baby was black. And the FBI persecuted her. And the FBI planted phony stories, in the, particularly in the Los Angeles press. And Jean Seberg committed suicide. Her husband, who was the French consul in Los Angeles, a writer, wrote a book about the FBI and his wife, Jean Seberg. There was a consistent pattern in which the FBI associated women with a kind of perverse left-wing politics. I know in my own case that when I made a film about the Weather Underground, that the FBI seemed more interested in people like Bernadine Dorn, Kathy Boudin, Kathy Wilkerson, Sylvia Baraldino, and others, more interested in them than in men. In a funny kind of old-fashioned way, it seemed shocking to the FBI that women could be assertive, that they could be leaders, that they could direct something instead of following like a farm wife in the year 1870. Or perhaps in the way that Hoover's friend followed him, Mr. Tolson. Now, to me, one of the most wildest things was that Hoover even attacked gay people. When he himself was gay, and nobody ever had the courage to say this, he lived with Clyde Tolson as man and wife for 30 of the years that he ran the FBI. And if somebody applied to the FBI and was gay, he would be rejected because he was queer. I mean, you know, it's, it's a kind of theory of royalty that the king can do no wrong. King John Edgar and his wife, Clyde, and his queen, Clyde, can do no wrong, but anybody else, bingo. Now, to me, that is simply outrageous. In effect, you compiled some files on J. Edgar Hoover, 
in your uh, film. You exposed Hugh, um, Hoover to public scrutiny in the same way that he used to like to uh, expose people. Except I couldn't, I can't hurt anybody. Right, and and what I was exposing was the f truth right. and not secret files. Uh, th those secret files were really, really crazy because they were so complete. I mean, I enlisted to be a flyer. And uh, when I was in flying school, he, I mean... This is World War II. World War II. Right. He corrupted people. He had people, I don't know what made them do it, he did it with military intelligence, reporting on what I was doing all the time while I was in the Air Force. <laughs> and there I was flying expensive equipment, and uh, these people were reporting. They had nothing to report, because I'm not an idiot. I never talked Marxism in the Air Force. I mean, besides, I wanted to be in it and all that. And I was very, the only thing I did that, that he didn't care about, only the local police cared about, I was the wing commander of my class. You see, this drove the FBI crazy, too. <laughs> and uh, two other aviation cadets and I, and we were getting ready to graduate. We, we were in Texas. In that time, the Rice Hotel, which is nothing now, was the best hotel in Houston. This was many years ago, 1943. We rented a big suite, and we got drunk. And I used to have a knife, and I took the knife and split open the pillows, and all the feathers came out. They didn't have air conditioning in those days. They had fans. So I had the fans going with the feathers flying, and I said, snow room, this is a snow room, and we kept drinking and feathers flying. That was a really serious offense because the Houston Police Department came, and they said, oh, come on, we're going to have to take you off to jail, and the manager said, you don't have to take him to jail, it'll affect their careers, all you have to do is pay for it. So we paid for the damage and got off, but I mean, that was the, the real crime of my military career. And lo and behold, in my military and FBI records, are things that even Lenin would have been afraid to do. For example, he charged me with getting up at a pro-Soviet meeting and taking out my wallet and emptying it, emptying the money from my wallet for the Soviet Union. Anybody who knows me well knows that the only time I empty my wallet is in a bar. When I was a very young man uh, waiting to go to flying school, I had nothing to do. And I talked to a friend of mine who was an older man, a club man, uh, a gentleman about town in Washington who had a powerful job in the government. And he got me a job in what later became the War Production Board. Once, uh, twice a month, he would take me to lunch to his club. He was an old-fashioned, conventional sort of person. He had known my uncle, who was in the diplomatic corps. I, uh was sitting at lunch and he looked over and smiled and he said, now Dee, what are you going to really do when you grow up? Grow up, I thought to myself, grow up. So I looked at him and smiled back and I said, I, I think that I'd like to be an eggplant. He said, what? What do you mean, eggplant? I forgot that story. It didn't seem very impressive to me. And then in the 1970s, actually after 1975, when I started to sue the government uh, for my files under the FBI and under military intelligence, lo and behold, I received a document stating that I would like to be an eggplant. I feel that I have now ach achieved that status by allowing both of these fans to be on as we did this take. So I will say that over again. All laughing is by me, darling. There are also scenes in this movie of your friend John Cage baking bread, speaking about his philosophy of creativity, and your wife uh, Nancy uh, giving you a haircut. What are the significance of these sections of the film interspersed with the more explicitly well I, th I consider the john mm. edgar hoover elements uh -huh. non-human uh -huh. and the other elements are the human elements i see my wife uh, does cut my hair because she does in real life right. i can't stand going to barbers i don't know why i mean maybe my brother who's a psychiatrist could tell me or my wife who's a psychoanalyst could tell me <laughs> but i can't stand having some guy want to put uh, smelly stuff in my hair and all that so i I've now had two women I've lived with for a long time, uh, for now 25 years, cut my hair. 
and only once did I go to a barber, and that was when the first one died. One time I went to a barber and all that experience. So that's why I had the uh, haircut in the film, uh, because um, it really is who I am. And uh, my wife's nephew filmed that, so it was a very intimate family kind of thing. Mm. John Cage has been a friend of mine since 1952 or three. The composer, John Cage. The composer. Cage. And he's the most important intellectual influence in my life, and that's why he's, he has no politics at all. The part of the education that really influenced my life and my work was given, was provided by John Cage. He never meant to be an educator, but he has been. I met John when he was poor and I was doing nothing in the early 50s, something like 1953. I was living in the country with my wife, Lois Long. I was spending my time reading and chopping wood. And John was writing music that nobody was listening to. We both had a lot of time. And I had a lot of liquor. He used to come to my house every night and we drank and drank and talked and talked. One night, he gave me a koan. I've been thoroughly grounded in Western philosophy, but I'd never even heard of what a koan was, K-O-A-N. But I didn't stop him. I let him tell the koan. That koan was as important to me as Karl Marx or Hobbes or Plato or Schopenhauer, because all of my life was rooted in the West. I never had any interest in the thought of the East. So John said to me, once there were two monks, young. They approach a, a stream that's pouring, over, overwhelmed by an enormous storm. And a young woman comes up and looks at the stream and is terrified and looks about her. The monks, of course, don't say anything. They look at her. And then one of the monks picks her up and lifts her across the stream and puts her down. And the two monks walk on in silence for an hour. The second monk says to the first, the first was the one who picked her up, why did you pick that girl up? You know it's against the rules of our order ever to touch a woman. And the first monk said, put her down, I did an hour ago. That koan uh, taught me something about the ellipsis of language and of ideas. It did not turn me into a Buddhist. It did not turn me into a, uh, one who proclaimed Eastern philosophy. But it opened my mind as much of what John taught me. John taught me the single most important lesson of my life because it has to do with my work, and he was totally unaware of it because I had, a, I had no idea at that time what my work would be. I'd been a student most of my life, and a hustler, and uh, a drinker, and a chaser after women, and a soldier, but nothing that would indicate that I would be an artist. And John smiled and laughed and said, Dee, artists make art. And you know, like everything that John says, it sounds so simple, so naive, and it's profound. You know, it's, I wanted to be an artist. I didn't know which way to go, and he just said, and we maintained this relationship over many, many years. And uh, he's politically radical in that he thinks that Thoreau was the greatest American. Thoreau who went to prison for one day rather than pay, rather uh, than, than, uh, than pay his tax for an unjust war, the Mexican War. See, this is, raises an interesting point about your film work as a whole. Many people see you as a political filmmaker, making the documentaries, the political, historical... I documents. am a political right. filmmaker. Right. right, but in addition, you're an artistic filmmaker. In other words, art and politics... No, that's one thing. I'm an artist who makes political films. Okay, so that's the way you would see yourself. Yeah. This is sometimes neglected in uh, analyses of your work. People fail to see the radical innovations you've made in the documentary film, your use of it for artistic statements, 
visions, your use of well, funnel. Look, look at even Mr. Hoover and I. That's yeah. nobody's made a film like that. Right. I mean, I can't say that it's. I don't think it's that original. But the fact that nobody else did it must mean that it's somewhat original. I mean, I made a film about myself. I'm not a particularly good actor, and I'm the main actor in the film. And uh, it's it's not easy to talk for 89 minutes, and my voice is <laughs> just about the only voice in that film, except for a few words of Nancy's and of John's. Mm. And I know the film works, as I've only shown it about four times, because I don't even have a final release print or release prints. All I have are two answer prints, which are not correct. And it played here. And you know how people applauded. It was remarkable. And the same thing has happened every time it's played. Politics is uh, in itself a curious word. I think we use it in a trivial sense when we say the politics of President Roosevelt or the politics of President Nixon or the politics of President Bush. It doesn't really have a meaning. I always see it as having a different meaning when I use it, when I say I. I'm involved in politics or I make political films. For me, the word politics means social change, not moving chess pieces along from one presidency to the other, from one president to another, which is the way I think it's used by the Republican and Democratic parties. Ordinarily, any society that is in trouble undermines language. It attacks language. And the words that we use over and over are familiar and untrue. When you say I'm in politics today, what you really mean is I have an ambition to become a governor, a mayor, a pseudo statesman, a president, what have you. When I say I have politics, I mean I want to change the social structure, that I see something out there that's wrong, I see something out there that's sick, I see something out there that means that there's injustice, that uh, people are denied the basic ordinary dignity of life and so that implies social change and that's a different meaning of politics you won't find my meaning in the dictionary you find one that's closer to the other one but words aren't necessarily circumscribed by dictionaries because words are really circumscribed by life and when we live in high political moments then the word politics has a different meaning we had politics in the sixties simply because a great many young people became tremendously involved with the hope of social change. And that's why we're in such a quiescent period now, because it failed. The system was strong enough. This is the strength of democracies, that they create the illusion of change. But in fact, what they do is permit change, a certain kind of change. And when the students in the 60s got hard, they were crushed. Chicago, the 1968 Chicago riots were by the police, not by the students. And that police riot was planned. The point of that police riot was to go out over world television to say that the United States government would take no more of this. That if you were willing to have your skull cracked, if you were willing to spend a few days in jail crowded like sheep, if you were willing to have your record destroyed forever and go into a permanent FBI file, then you could demonstrate in that way. And if not, not. And that's a simple and cruel way of, and it took place all over the country. The nature of the police went back to the period of the 1880s and 90s when the police beat, killed, mowed down so-called anarchists in the Haymarket riots and those other riots. The police moved into that same position in the 60s because the game was getting out of control. The game was no longer played by the government's rules. And Kent State was the height of it. When the, when the National Guard could fire on harmless, peaceful, demonstrators and kill them, a very clear message was sent to the young people of this country and to all people who were political, in the sense that I use that word. Then you had either the end of the movement or revolution. And of course it was the end of the movement and a kind of slow death for political ideas. We no longer have politics, as I use that word. 
But I think we're on the verge of it, and I think that's why we're making this film. I think we're on the verge of a new kind of social change. History doesn't repeat itself. It only appears to repeat itself. The new change can't, the form of the new change cannot be predicted. We will be aware of that form as it takes place. We can never forgive J. Edgar Hoover for trying to destroy the civil rights movement. And he gave that his best shot, and it was dishonorable. And it's dishonorable for any American politician to deny rights to any American citizen. Either we're a democratic country or we're not. And if we're democratic, who among us does not have rights? And that's a fundamental question. And I think, I think that's the part of this country that has to be defended. And rights have to be defended all the time. Because rights are under attack all the time. Rights are only made when people will fight for them. And when people give up on rights, they lose the rights. And all governments are that way. All governments. Uh, if, you, if you think I'm an anarchist, maybe I am. And people have to reinvent themselves all the time. And a country has to be reinvented all the time. And the idea of liberty has to be fought for and reinvented all the time. And it's exactly what we should be doing instead of being repressive, instead of having an FBI that wonders what you read or what I say or whom you go out with, uh, it should worry about, about who is breaking the laws, the real laws that should not be broken. And we should be making a new kind of life in this country that isn't for the rich, because most of the people in this country aren't the rich. This is not a world of George Bush's. This is not a sleazy world of the Reagans. And this is a world of, of many kinds of people from, of different colors and races, of different uh, national backgrounds, all in one place. And it seems to me that we, it, it devolves on us to be experimental, to be radical, to be open, to seek justice, to risk our lives for the truth. And um, we're not doing that. And nobody's ever done that. Well, Dee, you have done it. I think no, you just no, gave... No, no country's ever done oh, it. Oh, no country, but individuals within this country. Yeah. I think you just gave a remarkable statement of what your life's work. No, all I'm also a hypocrite and a yeah. liar and, a, and uh, <laughs> you know, come on, I'm a human being, so I'm, right. I'm full of error. But, but you, the collective you know, people okay. of this country uh, mm -hmm. interest me more than I'm interested in myself. And I'm, mm -hmm. that may sound like a lie, but it isn't. I mean, mm -hmm. the idea of living in a country that would change that way. I mean, I think that Thomas Jefferson, in spite of the... F you can't blame Jefferson for his, his acts and thoughts, which were natural in his time. But I think that people like Jefferson and Lincoln and Tom Paine in particular, and a good many other Americans, have stood for something that all the world admired. And one of the things that rankles us now is that nobody admires us. Mm -hmm. Because we have nothing to hold up. I mean, to really, can, can, can one imagine that people would, would admire a country ruled by Ronald Reagan and his wife? It seems to me unbelievable, not credible. And I think, you know, I think one of the points of all my work is it's directed to change mm -hmm. and to changing the country and getting young people in particular to believe that it's possible to do tremendous things, things that require daring and, and, and to make a new world. I mean, this place was called a new world. We're now an old world, you know. We have lost our ingenuity as well, even in, even in the business world that I don't care that much about. But we... Uh, we were the new world and we are now in, in every sense the old countries, Germany, Japan, <coughs> countries long before there was the United States, are the new world. There are even more new ideas in Germany now. And uh, so that's why I make films. You also, it seems to me, have done quite a bit of reinventing documentary. I'm struck by how different your films are. Every single film you seem to approach 
from a new angle. There's always some innovative features in it. So I think as well as this political aim of telling the truth and exposing the lies and dealing with the hard and controversial issues, you really have attempted to innovate the documentary film, to develop it in new directions, to make formal contributions to the film. And it's this intersection of art and politics that I see as defining your work as a whole. And I think they're related because art can be emancipatory. The notion of formal innovation of invention, of openness, of creativity, of doing something new is an analog to political change. It's the same process. I, I, uh, I agree with you. I, th I think that, I mean, I think this is what my work tries to be. Mm -hmm. And, I, and there's no point in saying, in giving a speech like the one I just gave and, and making it and saying this is a film because it isn't. I mean, a film is something else. If we were to, con we could make a film doing this with the, the TV cameras, we'd have to rethink the whole thing and change the form around. Uh, and it's a, it's, a very, it's a very heavy problem, say, to change the very nature of an interview. I'm looking into Lisa's camera. And uh, so uh, I mean, I'm in this static position. So the only thing I can hope for is to say something that's different or else pull out a clown's hat. <laughs> and wear it, or you know something else. But, but I do think that we always have to test. I mean, that really is what the game is about. And, and, but uh, okay, uh, what you're saying is absolutely correct. And I'm rambling because, uh, the ho I mean, I could never stand to make the same film over, which is why I could never work in Hollywood. Mm -hmm. In Hollywood, if you make a really successful picture that brings in a fifty million dollar profit. You know, you have uh, that guy with the claws, number four. Number five, what is he? The guy that scratches, kills the women. Oh, Freddy or Freddy. something. Uh, no. I mean, those things um, are not inventive. They're not new. They're not exciting. And they're dead. And uh, we have to look for a new art. And that's why I liked painting, frankly, because it, because it was an individual enterprise. And a painter could paint not because he had to change it, but because he, he, had, he had no alternative, I and mean, not because there was any demand in the market. I mean, the painters were honest in that sense. They, they weren't changing the way a tailor would change fashion for, and clothing. And um, that's why one of the reasons I was intrigued with the painters. I found so many people on the left sterile when it came to ideas about what art should be, or film should be, or poetry should be. They were back at some other place that had already been explored and finished, and dug up. The evacuation was there, and oh, all that was ready was a coffin. It ne needed was a coffin, a tombstone. Uh, ultimately, why did you choose then documentary as your media of choice? You started off more interested in art, really. You were very involved in the art scene. Why was it that documentary, rather than fictional film or painting or any number of other? Movies? Well, first, I loved the document. I loved, uh, and but and the second and and equally important is frankly money. Is that you were, you could you could make a work that was reasonable in price. My stuff isn't that cheap, actually. Uh, when you put them all together, I've spent a few million dollars. But that's for 10 films, whereas a $2 million film in Hollywood is, is not much. I mean, not having to raise a lot of money or have a lot of money is freedom. It's a way to make films or to make a, make a work of art that isn't produced by an accountant or and was surrounded by three lawyers. Do you have any projects coming up now? Are you working on anything? Well, the enthusiasm of other people and in myself for this new film leads me to think that I should make another film. And uh, I'd like to make a film about something. I, I, I'd like to make a film about some women. Uh, I don't know who they are, but I'd like to make a film about women to see if I could really understand what women think that I don't think because I'm not a woman. And it would be political, too. And uh, one of the things I've liked about my work in the past is that I've hired so many women 
and got them in a position where they could leave, which is what I always wanted them to do, so they could go and make their own work. I like to hire people who had no experience because then they wouldn't have bad ideas. And uh, some of them went on to become phenomenally successful. And some settled for children and marriage. And, you know, life is, life is composed of choice. I, I don't like one more than the other. I mean, they, mm -hmm. they were all like children to me in a sense. So, uh, are there more questions? Or? No, that's it. I want oh, to thank you very so much. So we come to the yeah. end. Yeah. Come to the end. <laughs> thank you so much for coming to Austin. Well, we showed all I of can't tell you how happy I am to be here. This was, uh, you know, this was a great reception and tremendous people. And it's not bullshit. And, uh, uh, you know, the response on the campus was terrific, and uh, uh, I feel I'm among friends here. So. <laughs> Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you so much, Pete. And that's the end of this Alternative Views. Frequently hear from viewers who request a list of news publications which we use on Alternative Views and also a reading list for U.S. power structure in the mass media. If you would like to have these, send a stamped, self-addressed envelope to the Alternative Information Network. P.O. Box 7279, Austin, Texas, 78713. You must send a self-addressed stamped envelope. We'd like to thank the people who assisted on our program. Catherine Galatera provided editing assistance, and Brian Lynch was our director. And Lisa Ann Henderson was the person who did such a wonderful job in editing the whole four-part series on Emil D'Antonio. Alternative Views is a production of the Alternative Information Network, P.O. Box 7279, Austin, Texas, 78713. So there's our address. If you would like to contact us or have any comments about the program, either our D'Antonio series or any other programs, or any questions at all, please write to us at this address. If you're interested in seeing Mr. Hoover and I in its entirety, contact MPI Home Video, 15825 Rob Roy Drive, Oak Forest, Illinois, 60452. The phone number, 1-800-323-0442. And if you would like to see Painter's Painting in its entirety, contact Mystic Fire Video Incorporated, P.O. Box 1202, Montauk, New York, 11954 is the zip code. And the phone number is 1-800-727-8433.